Good morning, everybody. I hope you all are doing well. I hope you all are doing fine. I really wish that you all are done with quite a lot of your revision. The whole objective behind meeting you all again this morning, just before your exam, you all are just two and a half hours away from your exam. The whole reason is, I'm sure you might be having some concepts left. Last minute revising them is getting a little difficult. Any such concepts, if you have, please keep telling me in the chat box or keep telling me in the Telegram channel. One by one, I'll keep going, all right? And I'll keep discussing them with you all, all right? I know it's not a good excuse. I wasn't able to spend time with you all yesterday at all because of a personal issue. But then now I want to spend the last two hours with you all, guys. Anything at all you think, ma'am, it's not happening. It's not going into my head at all. Please tell me in the chat box and or in the Telegram channel. All right, one by one, we will keep finishing it off. All right. So uh, the very first concept that we're going to be discussing today, uh, like how you guys have mentioned in the Telegram channel, I'm starting with the General Clauses Act and interpretation of statutes. All right. The important concepts in these two um, chapters. So starting with the General Clauses Act, Listen, first, the very first MCQ possible, when did this act come into force? On 11th of March, 1897. And this law is called the father of all central laws because it applies in the interpretation of all central laws, right? So this act applies to central acts. Whenever It, it is not applicable to state laws because state governments have their own general clauses act. All right. Then another important point. This is important. What is the whole objective? What is the whole purpose of the act? Three points. Number one, it shortens all the other acts. Number one, it shortens the other acts. Number two, it brings uniformity. What sort of uniformity does it bring in? It defines important concepts. It defines important terms. So we, the important terms don't have to be defined in every law. If every law defines good fit, every law will define it in different ways. So there will be no uniformity. We want uniformity in definitions. So in one single place, all the definitions are given. And number three, interpretation. In General Clauses Act, now you think for yourself, do we talk about just definitions in General Clauses Act? No, right? We also have so many interpretation tips given in the General Clauses Act. For example, how to interpret may, how to interpret shall, how to interpret a bill, how to interpret an act. Then what is how, how do you handle from and to? So, so many interpretation tips and tricks are also given to us in the General Clauses Act. So, it, it also the another objective of General Clauses Act, the third objective is to put in one place all the provisions regarding interpretation of words and legal principles. So, come on, tell me what are the three things you will write? What is the objective of the General Clauses Act? Number one, it shortens all the other acts. Number two, it provides uniformity of expression. Uniformity of expression, keyword. Number three, it provides in one place all provisions regarding to interpretation of words and legal principles. Interpretation of words and legal principles. Shortens acts, uniformity, interpretation. Remember these three, rest you will be able to write. Shortens the other acts, provides uniformity of expression and provides in one place in, uh, provisions regarding to interpretation of words and legal principles. All right. What is the third point? Provides in one place provisions regarding interpretation of words and legal principles. All right. Now coming to the next point, preamble important. What is preamble? It is definitely a part of the act. This is important, guys. SOP. What does the preamble contain? It contains the scope, object and purpose of the act. Scope, object and purpose of the act. When do we look at the preamble? When we want to know what is the intention of the lawmaker, we will come and look at the preamble. When I'm reading the statute, if I come across any ambiguity, if there is some ambiguity in understanding the statute, again, I will come and look at the preamble. I may get some interpretational tips from here. So what is preamble? It is definitely a part of the act. It tells us the scope, object and purpose of the act. It tells us the whole intention. Why, the, why did the lawmaker make the act in the first place? When do we refer to the preamble? Whenever there is any ambiguity in understanding any provision of the act or when the language of the statute is not clear, we come to the preamble, hoping the preamble will help us in interpretation. As an aid to construction, 
aid help it helps in construction here construction refers to interpretation it helps us in interpretation when words of the statute are giving rise to doubts in other words same thing guys what we learned over here same thing in elaborated words if the words of the statute are very vague or ambiguous they're giving rise to doubts or when one word has more than one meaning then we can come to the preamble and we might be able to find the correct interpretation from the preamble but 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 this is important true or false question from here possible what if the preamble says something which is against the act then what are you going to apply if the preamble says something which is against the act you will always apply the act the act will override the preamble preamble will not override the act got it guys so that was about preamble and uh, for preamble please remember these two examples also what does the companies act 2013 say the preamble of companies act 2013 says an act to consolidate and amend the law relating to companies an act to consolidate and amend the law relating to companies in one act all the rules and regulations relating to companies negotiable instruments act what does its preamble say an act to define and amend the law relating to promissory note bills of exchange and checks an act to define and amend the law relating to promissory note bills of exchange and checks all right till here clear guys stay calm all right you all have prepared you all have prepared really well the exam will go properly do not worry just stay calm concept after concept just keep absorbing along with me and you will be fine okay listen to the next point now some definitions now we all know definitions are given in section 2 of the act generally but sometimes the law may refer the definition to some other statute for example companies act 2013 how many times we use the word security but the word security is not defined in companies act 2013 instead it says to know the definition of securities go to securities contract regulation act 1956 so even this is allowed either section 2 will give us the definition or sometimes it will refer us to other statutes all right now two types of definitions we know exhaustive definitions and extensive definitions exhaustive definitions they will have the words means or means and includes exhaustive definitions they'll have the word means or they'll have the word means and includes extensive definition you will find the word just include or to apply to and include all right now remember whenever we have an extensive definition whenever the word include is there in the definition remember whatever is given in the definition is not the actual meaning of that term it is just examples for example dividend includes interim dividend now it doesn't mean that dividend means interim dividend it doesn't mean that dividend is equal to interim dividend what it just means is that even on interim dividend i will apply the dividend rules and regulations so when i have the word include written in the uh in 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 my definition it indicates the definition is not exact proper definition the definition is just trying to give us some examples of that particular word all right so exhaustive definition extensive definition they might ask you examples only then give examples if they are not asking you for examples in the examination please do not waste your time in giving examples all right so what is a definite uh, example for an ex exhaustive definition the simplest definition the simplest example director means a director appointed to the board of the company director means a director appointed to the board of the company extensive definition a best example easiest example dividend dividend includes interim dividend all right then coming to the next point shall and may now the word shall indicates a mandatory provision may indicates a directory provision not mandatory provision these words you will remember for sure but mcqs they might try to twist shall indicate something which is mandatory or imperative remember guys even imperative means what mandatory when i say something is imperative it means that is compulsory it is mandatory so for shall what are your keywords mandatory imperative for shall what are your keywords mandatory and imperative 
for me your keywords are directory or enabling may something which is not mandatory but then uh, what are the keywords how will you explain the word may directory or enabling come on once again if i write the words shall shall the keywords will be mandatory and imperative guys and when we use the word may your keywords will be directory and enabling directory and enabling shall will be mandatory and imperative may will be directory and enabling but listen the word may is used in the statute okay but along with that even a penalty provision is given if the word may is coupled with a penalty provision then you will treat it as if it is shall for example i'll just give you one random example okay it's not an actual example let us say the law says that the assess uh, the company shall uh, the company may file the return within 10 days if the company doesn't file the return within 10 days it will be punished with a fine of 1000 so even though it used the word may it has also put a penalty provision when this happens even though i have the word may it is not an optional provision anymore it now becomes a mandatory provision so may plus penalty you treat as if it is shall all right then what is a bill bill is a draft of a legislative proposal keyword bill is a draft of a legislative proposal it has to be passed by both houses of the parliament and we need the assent of the president it will become an act right so till here are we following bill is a draft of a legislative proposal has to be passed by both houses of the parliament and then it becomes an act once it becomes an act it becomes a law of the land and all of us have to follow it coming to the next point the next definition what is an act what is the definition of act forget about this we will learn the definition through this diagram learn it through the diagram it will be easier for you to recall when you are recalling before the examination you will be able to pictureize the diagram the word act used with reference to an offense or a civil wrong what does this mean when i say offensive act or when i say wrongful act there what does the word act mean so the word act used with reference to an offence or a civil wrong includes a series of acts words which refer to acts done and illegal omissions it includes a series of acts not just one it includes many acts then words which refers to acts done doing something also includes you not doing something omissions come on again the word act used with reference to an offence or a civil wrong the word act used with reference to an offence or a civil wrong includes a series of acts words which refer to acts done and illegal omissions right guys if you are following the study plan i had told you then this was the time when you would anyways be revising general clauses and ios once again remember we had discussed the general clauses in ios on a uh, day before yesterday you would have finished but this morning i had told you just run through it once i am doing exactly that for you so if you've been following the plan then this is exactly as per the plan guys keep repeating you've already studied you know it all right what is an act act used with reference to an offence or a civil wrong include the series of acts words which refers to acts done and illegal omissions then coming to the next definition what is affidavit guys affidavit also called as oath also called as swearing so they ask you definition of oath do not wonder what it is affidavit oath swearing one and the same thing look at the definition affidavit includes affirmation what does it include affirmation and declaration affirmation and declaration in the case of persons by law allowed to affirm or declare instead of swearing once again what do you mean by affidavit it includes affirmation and declaration in the case of persons by law allowed to affirm or declare instead of swearing how will we learn this these two words are in your memory affirmation and declaration includes affirmation and declaration then in the case of persons by law allowed to affirm or declare in the case of persons by law allowed to affirm or declare instead of swearing it is actually nothing but a written oath guys it's actually nothing but you giving something in writing which is the truth you are swearing something in writing 
So it includes affirmation or declaration in the case of persons by law allowed to affirm or declare instead of swearing. All right, then coming to the next discussion, what do you mean by commencement? The word commencement used with reference to an act or a regulation means day on which the act or regulation comes into force. Once again, what is what does the word commencement mean? When I say commencement of an act or when I say commencement of a regulation, what does commencement mean? Commencement means the day on which that act or that regulation came into force. All right, guys, come on, shall we revise the definitions we've learned until now one last time? Come on, tell me what is act? The word act used with reference to offense or a civil wrong includes a series of acts, words which refers to acts done and illegal omissions. Then what is affidavit? Affidavit includes affirmation and declaration in the case of persons allowed to affirm or declare instead of swearing. Then what do you mean by commencement? Commencement used, used with reference to act or regulation means day on which the act or regulation comes into force. Act or regulation, day on which the act or regulation comes into force. Now, what is enactment? Very simple. Your hint is RAP, RAP, Regulation Act Provisions. Regulation Act Provisions. What is enactment? Enactment includes Extensive definition, enactment includes regulation, act and provisions. Then they may ask you a question, year and financial year, are they the same thing? Year and financial year, are they the same thing? You will say no. Year means calendar year and calendar year is as per the British calendar, which is January to December. But financial year is from 1st April to 31st March. So year and financial year are not the same. Month also is month as per the British calendar. Then coming to a very important discussion, guys. What exactly do you mean by good faith? Good faith as per the General Clauses Act, a thing shall be deemed to be done in good faith if it is done honestly, whether it is done negligently or not. You did something honestly, that is enough. You did not have any wrong intention, that is enough. Now, whether you did it negligently, or diligently, whether you did it carelessly or carefully, we don't care under General Clauses Act. We only care about what was your intention. If your intention was doing it honestly, then it is good faith. So a thing shall be done, shall be deemed to be done in good faith if it is done honestly, whether it is done negligently or not. If it is done honestly, whether it is done negligently or not. Whenever you get a question about good faith, please don't stop here. Also write about Mong Gong Fu versus Mong Si Mong. A very funny case study name. But then, yes, we will be writing this also in the examination. Mong Ong Pu versus Mong Si Mong. Now, what was decided in this case study? What was decided in this, uh, uh, in this case? That the definition of good faith will not apply to all laws. See, we know that General Clauses Act, what did we study just now? When did it come into force? 11th March 1897. Now, even before 11th March 1897, we used to have other General Clauses Acts also. So uh, the old laws, like for example, Indian Contract Act, Negotiable Instruments Act, all these laws were made even before our present General Clauses Act came into force. So on the old laws, our present General Clauses Act will apply only to some extent. To what extent is given in Section 4 of General Clauses Act? In Section 4, the good faith definition is not included, which means all the laws which were created before 11th March 1897, for example, Negotiable Instruments Act 1881, your Indian Contract Act 1872, in all these laws when you're doing interpretation, you can't apply General Clauses Act good faith definition. Why? Because Section 4 says clearly that from the General Clauses Act, which, which definition will apply to the old laws and that list does not contain good faith. So the definition of good faith, this definition cannot be used in Negotiable Instruments Act and Contract Act. So instead, we will use a definition which is given in the civil law. And what does a civil law say? Civil law says if you want to say something is done in good faith, it should be done with care and attention. 
a thing is not said to be done in good faith if it is done without care and attention so only if you do it with care and attention that is not only should you have a good intention you must also be doing it carefully you should not only be doing it honestly you should also be doing it carefully if you get any good faith question please play safe in the examination and write your answer from both the perspectives as per general clauses act a thing is deemed to be said in, uh, done in good faith if it is done honestly whether it is done negligently or not on the other hand as per civil law a thing is not said to be done good in good faith if it is done without due care or attention clear with this as per civil law a thing is not said to be done in good faith if it is done without due care and attention in conclusion as per general clauses act you do it honestly that itself is enough as per the civil law you should not only be doing it honestly you should also be doing it with care and attention please remember the name of the case study mong wong pu versus mong si mong in your entire other laws if i'm not wrong uh, in special contracts you learn one case ms aniruddin versus thomco bank which is relating to variation in terms of contract remember and in general clauses act you learn mong wong pu versus mong si mong all right these two case studies important then coming to the next discussion document o oh, a very important definition highly probable what do you mean by document we'll straight away see from the flow chart but please do not write flow charts in the examination write the sentences write it as points i am showing you flow charts because it will be easy for you to be uh, to grasp all right but in the examination please write as sentences please write as points what does document include document includes matter which is w e d document includes matter which is wed which is written expressed described where is it written expressed described upon any substance how is it written expressed described using letters figures and marks why is it written expressed described to be used for recording that matter all right once again what exactly do you mean by document document includes guys extensive definition document includes matter which is written expressed described where upon any substance how using letters figures marks why to be used for recording that matter one last time without seeing what is document document includes matter which is written expressed described where upon any substance how using letters figures marks why to be used for the purpose of expressing that matter in the memory written expressed described upon any substance using letters figures marks to be used for recording that matter now coming to the next discussion remember central when i just say government government will include central government and state government so when i say that pay, uh, gratuity like for example under the income tax act we say that commuted pension we say that commuted pension is exempt for government employees right so when i say it is exempt for government employees here government employees will be both central government and state government employees so government would be both central government and state government now what is immovable property immovable property includes land benefits arising out of land things attached to the earth things permanently fastened to anything attached to the earth once again what do you mean by immovable property land benefits arising out of land things attached to the earth things permanently fastened to anything attached to the earth it includes land then benefits arising out of land for example a mine things attached to the earth for example a tree or a plant or things permanently fastened to anything attached to the earth for example a machinery which you attach to the soil look at the examples guys trees immovable property why benefits arising out of land also things attached to the earth also right of way to access nothing but a road right of way to access immovable machinery fixed to the soil immovable standing crops standing crops means what the plant is still attached to the soil it is still rooted to the soil hence all of them will be considered as immovable property definition please without seeing immovable property includes land benefits arising out of land things attached to the earth things permanently fastened to anything attached to the earth 
all right then coming to the next point following are not immovable properties timber not permanent see why is timber not immovable property as long as a tree is attached to the soil it is immovable property once a tree is cut once i take the timber out of the tree timber is not immovable anymore right to drain of water your drainage system not immovable property then in, uh, one more thing i wanted to discuss with you from here soil for making bricks immovable property right to catch fish immovable property drainage system i just told you not immovable property guys this is important okay doors and windows of the house this is immovable property i really want you to remember this doors and windows of the house will be considered as immovable property because they are a part of the building now so they are immovable property all right so uh, what are the things to remember everything else you know remember this number 1 right of way to access this is immovable okay nothing but a road then remember timber tree is cut so it is not immovable anymore then right to drain water your drainage systems are not immovable then right to uh, then, then doors and windows they are immovable doors and windows they are immovable soil soil your earth your soil it is immovable soil is considered as immovable because it is a part of the earth so soil is immovable right to catch fish is also immovable doors and windows also immovable drain right to drain not immovable timber not immovable right of way to access immovable tharo till here able to grasp all this yes now listen listen to the next discussion what do you mean by person do you remember the hint for enactment what was a hint for enactment what is enactment i told you rap regulations act provisions now person your hint is cab company association body of individuals company association and body of individuals so what do you mean by person company ref uh, person refers to company association body of individuals person includes why includes because they are only examples of person so person includes company association and body of individuals then coming to the next part when did the act come into force when does an act come into force very simple it comes into force on the date which is written in the law itself but if no date is written in the law then it will come into force on the date on which it gets the president's assent so when does the act come into force it comes into force on a date which is written in the law itself which is written in the act itself but if no such date is written then you see when did the president give his assent the day on which the president gave his assent you will say the law came into force on that day the date on which the president gave his assent okay then coming to the next discussion section 6 important what is the effect of repeal what do you mean by repeal companies act 1956 removed from the law book companies act 1956 was repealed and in its place companies act 2013 was introduced now you know what is repeal repeal is nothing but we're removing the old law now if we remove the old law it will not revive anything during the period for which repeal is made which means once we've removed the old law once we've removed the 1956 act it is gone now the government cannot say section 10 alone let us bring again section 25 alone let us bring again no it can once the act is repealed it is dead now we cannot revive any part of the act anymore not possible once the act is repealed it cannot be it cannot be revived then once the act is repealed it does not affect anything performed under the repealed act under the old act you had appointed an auditor that appointment will not get affected anything which you've already performed under the old act will not get affected it will not affect any claim privilege responsibility or debt under the repealed act under the old act if you had any claim or any privilege or any responsibility or any debt that will still continue it will also not affect any punishment it will also not affect any inquiry litigation or remedy under the old act so under the old act nothing under the old act can be revived whatever you have already performed under the old act it will not get affected whatever claim privilege responsibility debt you had under the old law it will not get affected it will not affect any punishment 
all right it will not affect any punishment that you were given under the old act it will not also not affect any inquiry litigation or remedy under the old act whatever cases are going on against you under the old act they will still continue even though the old act has been repealed so your keywords now what are the keywords over here even though an act is repealed you cannot revive anything which is there in the old act you cannot affect anything which is already performed under the repealed act you cannot affect any claim privilege responsibility or debt you cannot affect any punishment you cannot affect any inquiry litigation remedy all right then remember section 8 section 8 says companies act 1956 is repealed in its place companies act 2013 has been brought into the force even now if some other law is still talking about 1956 act it automatically means that they are talking about the 2013 act so reference to provision repealed reference to companies act 1956 today will mean nothing but reference to provision reenacted will refer to nothing but the reenacted law will refer will refer to the companies act 2013 so today if any law still refers to companies act 1956 the repealed provision they are actually talking about nothing but the 2013 act the new provision the reenacted provision the reenacted law then when i use this you know very well when i use the word from i'll exclude the first day and when i use the word to i will include the last day i'm not going too much in detail here this point you know very well when we use the word from we exclude the first day and then we use the word to we include even the last day then gender and number you know this also uh, you know that singular will include plural masculine will include feminine and vice versa right so when i say a house i am actually even though i am using singular sense a house will actually include even many houses when i say you can be appointed in a subsidiary company in its subsidiary company i am not referring to just one subsidiary company i am ref referring to any number of subsidiary companies but if i clearly use the word one if i say you can buy only one house then i'm referring to only one but when we say when the law says you can buy a house singular that will include even plural so singular will include even plural plural also will include singular but when we use specific numbers like one house or two buildings when we use specific numbers like that then we cannot say singular will include plural all right coming to the next point when we talk about distance we are talking about straight line on a horizontal plane in other words we are talking about aerial distance how to measure distance when i say from the uh, end of the municipality next 2 kilometers also will be urban land how will i measure these 2 kilometers how do we measure this do we follow the road no we don't follow the road we draw a straight line on a horizontal plane we'll draw a straight line aerial distance on that basis we will measure distance all right so when we say measurement of distance we're talking about aerial distance aerial distance is nothing but a straight line or a horizontal plane then how to compute time in case the law says that from the date of special resolution within 30 days i'm supposed to file it with the roc now on the 30th day if the roc is office is closed for example covid lockdown all public offices also were closed on the last day if the office is closed then whenever the office opens again at that time we have to go and do the filing if we do the filing when the office opens again like that then it is as if we have done the filing within the prescribed time period on the last day if the office is closed we are supposed to do the filing at least when the office reopens later whenever the office reopens later on that day if we do the filing it is as if we have done the filing on time all right that was about computation of time then guys from here question is possible power to appoint includes power to appoint ex officio for example if i give central government a power to appoint a certain person let let us let us take one random example let us say i give central government power to appoint chairperson of nfra either central government can appoint a certain person either central government can say that anushri will be the chairperson of nfra either by name they can appoint or they can appoint ex officio for example they can say whoever is a secretary of ministry of finance that person will automatically become chairperson of nfra 
they can select that also so either they can appoint by name or they can appoint an office they can appoint a position secretary of ministry of finance so whoever is the secretary of ministry of finance will automatically become the chairperson of nfre either the central government can appoint by name or they can appoint by virtue of office appointing by virtue of office is called ex officio last few concepts and the general clauses act whenever the government makes a law if they want to make the law by previous publication previous publication means what first they will publish the draft rules all right in the official gazette anybody who has any suggestions or any objections we can send our suggestions to the government they'll mention a date on or before which our objections and suggestions have to be sent on that basis they will revise the draft law and the final copy of the law they will publish in the official gazette so in such cases in such situations they publish the law twice first they publish the draft laws the draft rules and then they publish the final rules in the official gazette then when the same offence is punished under two laws what will you do if the same offence is punished under two laws you will not punish me under both the laws you will punish me only under one of those two laws coming to the last concept under general clauses act service by post when do you say it is properly posted you should properly address it number 1 you must prepay the postal charges number 2 and you should post it by registered post when we say service by post it has to be properly addressed it has to be prepaid and it has to be sent by registered post come on once again what are the three points we are supposed to send it by properly addressing by prepaying and by registered post by properly addressing prepaying and by registered post but if the uh, law itself says that you are supposed to send it by regist uh, by speed post then you should send it by speed post if the law specifically mentions that what should be the mode in which you should send the post then you send it according to the specified mode but if the law is silent you can send it by registered post itself all right once i send the post accordingly i properly address it i prepay it and i send by registered post i send it properly to the landlord but the same is returned by the tenant with an endorsement of refusal let us say we sent a notice to the landlord properly we addressed it we prepaid it and we also sent it by registered post now at this place the tenant is available right now and landlord is not available the tenant refuses to accept the notice and the notice comes back it will be as if we had properly sent it in simple words guys once i fulfill all these three conditions even if it comes back it is as if i have properly served it it's as if i have properly sent it i sent it to the landlord i properly addressed it i prepaid it i sent it by registered post but the tenant refused to accept the letter it is as if i have served it properly whether you received it or not it is as if i have served it properly my responsibility is over this is about service by post one last concept guys this was asked in the november 2021 mtp they have not tested this in the examination till now so please be careful about this when we say pro rata basis what do we mean when we say that tax has to be calculated on pro rata basis what does it mean it means proportionate allocation pro rata means it has to be calculated proportionate basis it has to be calculated by proportionate allocation pro rata is latin term to describe proportionate allocation generally pro rata is something we apply to taxes like customs excise duty and all how much quantity or how much weight or what is the amount of the goods on that basis you pay right for example when i say gst is 18% this is pro rata right because we'll see what is the value of the goods if the value of the goods is 10000 10000 into 18% you will have to pay so this is pro rata duty this is called duty calculated on pro rata basis because how much tax do you end up pay it is a percentage of a certain value it is proportionate to a certain value all right so this is about pro rata basis until your general clauses act are we thorough anything in general clauses act do you want me to repeat once again anything that you weren't able to learn with me anything that you want me to discuss with you once again service by post you understood right this is important guys i sent the letter to you by properly addressing it i even prepaid it and i sent it by registered post the person who is living in that address he is not accepting that letter 
it is not my mistake it is as if it is presumed as if notice has been served all right please tell me those of you who are watching the session general clauses act are we done done and dusted can we close it yes shall we do interpretation of statutes next give me a moment please all right so coming to interpretation of statutes i know this is one dreadful chapter but guys right now is really not the time to be scared about this chapter let us embrace it let us do it as well as we can absolutely no negativity about this chapter anymore this point onwards all right let us try to absorb how much ever we can the difference between interpretation and construction we should absorb it in such a way the next 20 to 25 minutes i will be focusing on this chapter all right now as we discuss concepts here your focus should be to grasp in such a way in case you get an a question in the examination from here at least half the marks you should be able to attain i'm talking about those of you who have thought about skipping this chapter those of you who were not able to find the time to revise this chapter until now all right so those of you who have not revised this chapter until now in the last two and a half days you don't have much time you can't sit and study this chapter fully now so at least revise it in such a way along with me that in case you get a question you are able to write and able to score at least half the marks that will make a that will make quite a lot of difference to your total score all right listen first of all what is the difference between interpretation and construction listen if the words of the statute are simple and beyond that nothing else is required then it is interpretation if you are if the words of the law are simple if the court talks about the plain meaning of the language of the legislator and you don't have to go beyond you don't have to see what is the intention of the law maker and all if there is no ambiguity then it is interpretation but if there is an ambiguity the court has to go one step further the court has to see what is the real intention of the law maker that is construction so the cardinal rule of construction of a statute is to read it literally that is by giving ong by giving ordinary natural and grammatical meaning to the words used by the legislator if such meaning leads to absurdity and the words have another meaning courts may adopt the same this is the cardinal rule of construction what is construction first we will read the law literally that is first we will see the ordinary natural and grammatical meaning but if that is leading to absurdity then if there is some other meaning we will adopt that other meaning first we will see point by point you go okay first you will write about construction construction what is a cardinal rule we will first read it literally that is point number 2 we will look at the ordinary natural and grammatical meaning that is point number 3 in case ordinary natural and grammatical meaning is leading to absurdity the and if there is some other meaning we will adopt that other meaning this is construction then what is interpretation what is the cardinal rule of interpretation cardinal rule of interpretation is that if the language is simple and ambiguous then we will read just that if the language is simple and ambiguous we don't have to go beyond we don't have to you know um, try to find other meanings and all so when we restrict ourselves to the plain meaning of the language it is interpretation but when the meaning is not clear when the meaning is not plain the court will have to go one step further and see what is the intention of the law maker right that is construction important probable all right what is interpretation and construction these two words are used interchangeably but they are slightly different 
you will not be able to draw a line that this is where interpretation ends and this is where construction begins. But there is a basic difference. In construction, the cardinal rule is, first we will read it literally. First, we will see the ordinary natural and grammatical meaning. But if that leads to absurdity, then if words have another meaning, we will choose that. Then what is interpretation? In interpretation, if the language is simple and unambiguous, the language is plain, we will stick to that. We will not do any further reading. All right, interpretation and construction. Then, why do we need interpretation and construction? We need interpretation and construction because law is made by using language. And no language is so perfect that there is no ambiguity. In every language, there is some sort of ambiguity or the other. So, if the words are precise and unambiguous, then you don't need to do anything. But when there is a defect, when there is a, an ambiguity, when there is a doubt, the, co the judge cannot simply fold his hands and blame the draftsman. In that case, interpretation and construction are required. So first of all, if the question is, why do you need interpretation or construction? You will say law is expressed in language and no language is so perfect that there are no ambiguities. If the words are precise and unambiguous, then just verbal construction we will do. That is, we will just see what is their ordinary natural grammatical meaning story over. But when there is a defect, defect as in we hear defect means an ambiguity. When there is any ambiguity or when there is any doubt, the judge cannot simply fold his hands and blame the draftsman. The judge cannot blame the lawmaker that what kind of a law did you make? So instead, what will the judge do? He will have to try to find the meaning of the statute using the language of the statute, seeing what are the social conditions which gave rise to the statute and the mischief which was to be remedied. So why do we need interpretation, guys? We need interpretation because in case, we need interpretation because in case the intention of the lawmaker is not very clear. We need interpretation because in case there is any defect, in case there is any ambiguity, then the judge cannot simply blame the draftsman. That time he needs interpretation. At that time, he will, he will try to find the true meaning of the law by seeing what is the language of the statute, by considering what are the social conditions which gave rise to the statute, by seeing what was the mischief which has to be remedied. What are the three things he will see? Language of the statute, then the social conditions which gave rise to the statute and the mischief which was to be remedied. Will you remember the three things? Yes, by looking at these three things, he will try to give force to the intention of the legislature. He will give force and life to the intention of the legislature. So first, we learned the difference between interpretation and construction. Uh, when, when do I use the word interpretation? What is the cardinal rule of interpretation? If the meaning of the statute is very plain and unambiguous, we don't even have to read any further. We don't have to see other meanings and all. We can stick to that plain meaning that is interpretation. In construction, we will first try to read it literally. But and we will try to see what is the ordinary natural and grammatical meaning. But if that, that is leading to absurdity and if there is any other meaning, we will choose that other meaning which helps us apply the intention of the legislature. Then we saw what is the need. Why do we need interpretation and construction? We said law is expressed in language and language is not perfect so that there are no ambiguities. If there are no ambiguities, if it is unambiguous, then we will do verbal construction. Verbal construction means we'll just try to understand the words in ordinary natural and grammatical meaning, same ONG. But if there is a defect, if there is an ambiguity, then we cannot simply blame the draftsman. In that case, we have to see what is the language of the statute. We have to see what are the social conditions which gave rise to the statute and the mischief which was to be remedied. Language of the statute, social conditions which gave rise to the statute and mischief that was to be remedied. Now coming to the primary rules of interpretation, the first rule of interpretation, rule of literal construction. What do you mean by the rule of literal construction? This is a cardinal rule of construction. This is a main rule of in construction, the first rule. Latin maxim, please remember here, absoluta sententia expositor non indige. Absoluta sententia expositor non indige, which means that if the words are plain, if the words are ambiguous, you just find their ordinary, natural and grammatical meaning. You don't need any further explanation. You understand what is the rule of literal construction? Rule of literal construction, what is the Latin word? Absoluta sententia, expositor, non-indigent. 
absolute as sententia expositor non indigent which means you read the words and see see what is your ordinary natural grammatical meaning if that is not leading to any absurdity then you don't need any further explanation you don't need to adopt any different meaning you go to different meaning only when there is some absurdity in ordinary natural grammatical meaning so first priority do literal construction that is see if the words are plain and unambiguous if the words are plain and unambiguous you stick to their ordinary natural and grammatical meaning you don't have to look for further explanations if two interpretations are possible one narrow and the other wide if the narrow interpretation fails to achieve the purpose of the legislation one should adopt the wider one so two interpretations are possible one narrow and the other wider if the narrow one is not helping us reach the intention of the lawmaker then we will choose the wider interpretation okay then listen to the second rule of interpretation second primary rule rule of reasonable construction what do you mean by what is the, what is the latin maxim here ut res majus valiet quam periet what was it for a uh, literal construction absoluta sententia expositor non indigent reasonable construction ut res majus valiet quam periet that is words of the statute must be construed so as to lead to a sensible meaning reasonable constructions is first you will do literal interpretation first you will try to find the ordinary natural grammatical meaning but if that meaning doesn't make sense then you have to find the sensible meaning you have to construe you have to understand the law in such a way that you are able to give a sensible meaning you are supposed to find the intention of the lawmaker if the court finds that giving a plain meaning will not be fair or reasonable construction it becomes duty of the court to depart from the dictionary meaning and adopt the construction which will advance the remedy and suppress the mischief first we will see the plain meaning we will first see the ordinary natural and grammatical meaning but if that ordinary natural and grammatical meaning is not leading to a fair and reasonable construction then we cannot stick to dictionary meaning we have to depart from the dictionary meaning and we have to find the true intention of the lawmaker that is about a reasonable construction all right then coming to harmonious construction but wait before i do that somebody is asking for buyback of shares um life explorer okay so a buyback of shares listen in case that is the only thing you are stuck at all right and there's nothing else that you are worried about then for buyback there's a separate video already on my youtube channel uh, if you scroll below some some 7 to 8 videos if you see recent uploaded videos last 7 to 8 video i think you will find buyback watch it on 2x speed go finish it you will find it it is right there if you are not able to find it tell me again i'll send you the link okay if buyback is the only problem then don't waste your time watching this session here you simply go to that video and you watch it but you watch it in 2x speed okay it will get done faster i've i'll send you the link wait i sent the link in the comments box all right okay now coming to the next rule the rule of harmonious construction now what does this rule say this rule says when there is a conflict between two provisions of a statute or when there is a conflict between two statutes you must try to do a harmonious construction which is if there is a conflict between two provisions you should read them in such a way that you are able to give effect to both of them all right but if you are still not able to give effect to both of them then you will apply this rule generalia specialibus non derogant which means specific rule will override the general rule like for example schedule 3 of a companies act gives us the format for financial statements for insurance companies the format is given by the insurance act and both these formats are totally different it's an insurance company insurance act will also apply companies act will also apply conflict is there which is more specific insurance act is more specific we will apply that all right so generalia specialibus non derogant what does it mean
I am sorry for the interruption. So what does generalia specialibus non derogant mean? That specific will always prevail over general. If we are having a conflict, we will first try to read both the provisions in such a way that we are able to give effect to both of them. But if it is not possible, then we will see which is the more specific provision and we will apply that. So generalia specialibus non derogant. What was the key word we learned under... Um, what was the Latin maxim we learned under literal construction? Absoluta sententia expositor non indigit. Then for reasonable construction, we said ut res magis valiet quam periet. Harmonious construction, we said generalia specialibus non derogant. Now, now listen, if, some, if a provision is subject to, it means it is a subservient provision. Subject to means we will apply other provisions only if they are not applicable, we will apply this. The same subject matter is covered by that provision and another provision subject to which it operates. And there is a conflict between them. Let us say section 12 and section 15, they both talk about the same subject matter. They both talk about the same thing. And if section 12 is subject to section 15, then it means you will first apply section 15 and only then you will apply section 12. If you have two sections and both talk about the same subject matter, all right, then you will see if either of the sections have the word subject to written. If section 12 says subject to section 15, it means section 12 is saying I am subservient, which means I am submissive. First, you apply the other section, only then section 12. So this way you will be able to get a priority. Similarly, sometimes we may have the word notwithstanding written. A section which has notwithstanding written, it means it is saying that I am the most dominant section. If I have the word notwithstanding written in a section, I must apply that first. Instead of asking you about notwithstanding, they can ask you about non-obstante clause. They both mean the same thing. Non-obstante clause is nothing but a section which starts with the word notwithstanding. Notwithstanding, It is total opposite of subject to Y because subject to I told you, you'll apply it second. If a section has subject to written, it means give other sections priority, then come here. But notwithstanding is total opposite. If my section has the word notwithstanding written on it, I will first apply this section, only then I will apply other sections. This notwithstanding clause can operate at four levels. Either it can be notwithstanding another section. For example, section 12 may say notwithstanding what is written in section 15 or it may be notwithstanding anything in the statute. Section 12 can say notwithstanding anything written in negotiable instruments act or it can be notwithstanding anything contained in a section or subsection of another statute or it can be notwithstanding anything contained in any other law. See, listen, nothing to get confused. I'll simplify this for you. There are four levels. There are four levels in which we can make notwithstanding clause. In the first level, section 12 of negotiation, I'm just giving you an, a simple random example, okay? These are not actual examples. I'm just giving you examples so that you will be able to write the theory in the exam. For example, section 12 of Negotiable Instruments Act can say, notwithstanding anything written in section 15 of Negotiable Instruments Act. Section 12 is saying notwithstanding anything written in section 15, which means section 12, section 15, if there's a conflict, section 12, you will give priority. It is notwithstanding anything contained in section 15. Or we can say that section 12 of Negotiable Instruments Act can say notwithstanding anything contained in Negotiable Instruments Act, which means if section 12 and any other section of Negotiable Instruments Act is having a conflict, you will apply section 12 only. Or Section 12 of Negotiable Instrument Act can say, notwithstanding anything contained in Section 20 of Indian Contract Act. It may talk about some other act. So Section 12 of Negotiable Instruments Act and Section 20 of Contract Act, if they are having a conflict, you will apply Section 12. Or Section 12 of Negotiable Instrument Act can say, notwithstanding anything contained in any other law, which means any other law in the country is conflicting with Section 12, you will apply Section 12. Okay, so it can be either notwithstanding any other section in that same law or it can be notwithstanding any section in that law or it can be notwithstanding any other section 
any specific section in a different law or it can be notwithstanding any law all right so are you clear with the four levels guys what are the four levels notwithstanding anything contained in another section or notwithstanding anything contained in a statute or notwithstanding anything contained in a section of another statute or notwithstanding anything contained in any other law notwithstanding four levels are we done with this yes can i take you further to the next discussion uh, so the uh, we learned about three rules of three primary rules rule of literal construction rule of reasonable construction and rule of harmonious construction here that subject to and notwithstanding is important if i write the word subject to in a particular section it means that section is subservient which means you give other sections priority but if i write the word notwithstanding in a section it becomes non obstante clause one says notwithstanding it becomes a dominant section you give this section priority it may either be notwithstanding any specific section in that statute or it may be notwithstanding any other sections in that statute or it may be notwithstanding any specific section of some other statute or it may be notwithstanding any other law for the time being in force all right now you listen to my next discussion our next discussion is going to be about the uh, next rule of next primary rule rule of beneficial construction the most important rule the most important primary rule rule of beneficial construction also called as hayden's rule also called as rule of purposive construction also called as mischief rule what are the four names beneficial construction hayden's rule purposive construction and mischief rule what does this rule say this rule says whenever you are not able to interpret the law find four things number 1 what was the old law what was the law before making the act then what was the problem in the old law what was the mischief or the defect in the old law then what is the remedy that the new act is providing and what is the reason for the remedy four key points guys what was the law earlier before making the present law then what was the mischief or what was the defect in that old law then what is the remedy that the new law is providing and what is the reason for the remedy on the basis of the four things we will choose that interpretation which suppresses the mischief and advances the remedy we will choose that interpretation which suppresses the mischief and advances the remedy all right then coming to the next rule rule of adjustum generis another important point adjustum generis means of the same kind or species adjustum generis means of the same kind or species what this means is that if there is an enumeration enumeration means list it is a list of specific words and all the specific words fall under the same category all right and if that category is not exhausted by the list and a general term follows the list then and there is no indication of a different legislative intent then the general word you will understand the general word keeping in mind the specific words given for example very simple i have dogs cats and cows and etc i have a list of animals here this list of animals contains specific words these specific words are part of a single category they they form a part of a specific category domestic animals this list is followed by a general word this list is not exhausted by the specific words we have more domestic animals also then how do you interpret the word etc this word etc will take color from these words which means even this etc will be all about domestic animals only principle of adjustum generis applies only when specific words are all of the same nature only then you apply adjustum generis so when does adjustum generis apply when you have an enumeration you have a list of specific words the specific words belong to a specific category that category is not exhausted by these specific words you have many more domestic animals this list is not exhausting the specific category the list is followed by a general word now how do you understand the meaning of this general word etc also will include the same things of that category what is the category we identified here domestic animals so even etc will include animals of that same category which is domestic animals are you clear with adjustum generis 
uh, Faisal, I'm just seeing you've asked me once more, but once more for which concept, uh, Faisal? Tell me, are you talking about notwithstanding or are you talking about adjustum generis? Which point do you want me to repeat again? Tell me. Meanwhile, by, by the time I wait for your response, I'll just give you one quick revision of adjustum generis once again. When specific words are used, and after those specific words, some general words are used, general words would take their color from the specific words used earlier. That is, general words following specific words are to be understood with reference to the words that precede them. What it means is that I have an enumeration. I have a list of specific words. These specific words form a specific category, which is domestic animals. But this list does not exhaust that specific category. You have many more domestic animals. This list is followed by a general word. What is the meaning of this general word? Now, that is a question. Even this, this concept of adjustum generis says, even this general word will now belong to the same category which means under etc you cannot include a tiger because that will not be a domestic animal but under etc you can include a goat because it will be a domestic animal so even this word etc will be interpreted to include only those animals which come under that specific category okay now clear now did we understand is everybody clear with adjustum generis now faisal now clear All right, going further now to the next uh, primary rule, the rule of exceptional construction. What does this say? This talks about a certain, certain specific points. Number one, when I have the word or, it means optional, disjunctive, or the keyword is disjunctive and the keyword is conjunctive. Or is disjunctive and and is conjunctive. Or means optional and means all of them. All right. Then mandatory versus directly. This is something which I've already discussed with you even in the General Clauses Act uh, discussion that when I use the word may, it is not mandatory. Do you remember the keywords? May refers to a directory or an enabling provision. Remember I told you. And what does the word shall refer to? Shall refers to a mandatory or an imperative provision. We had discussed this. Then coming to the secondary rules of interpretation. So what are the primary rules that we learned before we start the secondary rules? What are the primary rules we learned about? The first primary rule was literal construction. Literal construction, what was the Latin maxim? Absoluta sententia expositor non indigent, which means I will first try to read the law on the basis of its ordinary, natural, and grammatical meaning, I will see the plain and ordinary meaning. If there is no absurdity there, I will stick to that plain, natural meaning. If two interpretations are possible, one narrow and one wide, if the narrow interpretation is not meeting the objective of the legislature, I will choose a wider meaning. Then I discussed with you about the rule of reasonable construction. Here the Latin maxim was ut res magis valiat quam periat, which means we will first obviously do literal construction. But if seeing the plain and natural meaning, if it is giving rise to absurdity, all right, then we will have to choose that interpretation which is more fair and reasonable. We'll have to choose that interpretation which fulfills the intention of the lawmaker. Then rule of harmonious construction, what did we learn here? Under the rule of harmonious construction, we said if there's any conflict between two provisions of a statute, we should read them in such a way that we're able to give effect to both of them. But if you're just not able to give effect to both of them, then we will have to apply this concept of generalia specialibus non derogant. That is, we'll have to see which of the two is more specific and we'll have to apply that. Specific will prevail over general. Then we said if in a particular section we have the word subject to, it indicates the subservient section. If this section and another section are conflicting, you will give priority to the other section. Then notwithstanding, here we said it's also called as non obstantic clause. If my section has the word notwithstanding, it gets priority over other sections. It becomes a dominant section. It may also be notwithstanding a specific section of that statute 
or it may be notwithstanding any other section of that statute or it may be notwithstanding any other section of some other statute or it may be notwithstanding any other law for the time being in force and then finally we said rule of beneficial construction here we said if there's any conflict we will look at the four things number one what was the law earlier what was the mess mischief or the defect in the old law what is the remedy which the new law is providing and what is the reason behind the remedy this is important here we will choose that interpretation which suppresses the mischief and advances the remedy we will choose that interpretation which suppresses the mischief and advances the remedy then adjustum generis we said of the same kind of species when does this rule apply this rule applies when i have an enumeration of specific words all the specific words belong to a specific category but the category is not exhausted by the list the list is followed by a general word the whole question is how do you interpret the general word to interpret the general word we said even that will include other things belonging to that same category so cats dogs and cows all belonging to a specific category domestic animals now if i write the word etc after this list etc will also belong to domestic animals category only etc also will include animals of the same domestic animals category only all right and finally we said rule of exceptional construction here it talks about certain specific things and is conjunctive or is disjunctive then may shall mandatory directory this you are already aware of all right then we also spoke about uh, uh, yeah so, so this is where we stopped about primary rules of interpretation now coming to the secondary rules of interpretation the first secondary rule is usage of practice what usage of practice says is that if a particular practice has been followed by the courts since very long if a particular interpretation they are following since very long and if the legislature is not amending it then we will assume that is a correct interpretation the judges the courts have been interpreting a particular law in a certain manner since many years the law maker the legislature is not amending it also it means that interpretation which they have been following since many years that interpretation is correct and they can continue to follow that this is the whole crux of usage of practice a uniform practice continued under an old statute inaction of the legislator to amend the same shows that the practice so followed was based on the correct understanding of the law i am interpreting a law in a certain way since years and years and even the legislature is not amending it we can assume that that in old interpretation is perfect and we can continue to follow that interpretation two latin maxims uh, two uh, latin maxims here optima ligam interpretest consuetudo which means custom is a best interpreter of law and contemporanea expositio est optima et fortissima in lege which means the best way to interpret a document is to read it like how it would have been read when it was made contemporanea expositio which means you read the law as if it was as if you were reading it at the time when it was made that interpretation will be the best and the strongest optima is best and fortissima is strongest so contemporaneous exposition contemporary exposition contemporary exposition means you read the law as if you were reading long back when the law was made contemporary exposition is the best and strongest in law all right so read the law as if you are reading it long back when it was made so usage or practice what does it mean what does it indicate If a particular interpretation i have been applying since years and years even the legislature has not amended it it means that interpretation is correct and we can continue to apply it two latin maxims number one optima legum interpretes consuetudo which means custom is the best interpreter and number two contemporanea expositio est optima et fortissima in lege which means contemporary exposition is the best and strongest in law contemporary exposition means reading it as if you were reading it long back when it was made give the same meaning to the words the meaning which was applicable long back when the law was made that is the meaning of this maxim so this is your first secondary rule usage or practice second secondary rule associated words to be understood in common sense manner nociter a sources this is your latin word here nociter a sources indicates give the same meaning to the word 
depending upon the meaning of the surrounding words meaning of a word is to be judged by the company it keeps for example when we say tax duty says or fee here when i say fee i want to understand the meaning of this word fee i will apply nociter as sources i will try to understand the meaning of the word fee with the help of the surrounding words with the help of tax duty says now tax duty says is something which we pay to the government so even here fee is something that we pay to the government only i will not cover all the fees i will cover only those fees which we pay to the government okay so nociter as sources understand the meaning of a word with the help of the company it keeps nociter as sources associated words to be understood in common sense manner shall we close the discussion regarding the secondary rules also are you feeling at least a little bit confident yes i know we are doing the revision just two hours before the examination but even if one of you is getting benefited out of this guys i will still continue to do this in uh, this revision all right even if one of you is getting benefited then that itself is objective accomplished of this revision yes guys till here are you confident the primary rules secondary rules those of you who were thinking of skipping this chapter entirely very quickly i have gone through this no doubt but this is just before the examination and this is the best amount of time we can spend on this chapter not more than this shall i quickly take you to internal aids now yes primary rules secondary rules fine you'll be able to handle primary rule rule of literal construction absoluta sententia expositor non indigent second rule reasonable construction ut res majus valiet quum periet third rule third rule was your um, harmonious construction generalia specialibus non derogant generalia specialibus non derogant all right then adjustum generis we saw and then after that we started learning secondary rules first secondary rule was usage or practice second secondary rule is associated words to be understood in common sense manner nociter a sources now we start with the easy part of the chapter internal aids we are done with the difficult part now we are going to start with the easy part we are going to be seeing what are the internal aids of construction internal aids these are things which you will find within the statute number 1 we have the long title every act has a short title and a long title short title helps you identify the act long title describes the act short title identifies the act long title describes the act so if you have any ambiguity about the whole objective of the law maker you can come and look at the long title it will help you understand what exactly the law is about so long title can be used for interpretation it is an admissible aid to construction remember the keywords short title identifies the act long title describes the act short title identifies the act and the long title describes the act the long title can be used for interpretational purposes now coming to the next point preamble we already spoke about preamble earlier scope object and purpose remember i told you the three things then heading and title just like how the law has a name similarly group of sections are put together under one single heading all right so groups of sections are put together under chapters and each chapter has a heading can the heading be used for interpretation there are two conflicting views one view says that heading is a key to interpretation of clauses arranged under it and might be treated as preamble to the provisions following it view 2 says heading should be resorted to only when enacting words are ambiguous but cannot be used to restrict the plain terms of enactment the first view says that heading has same significance as preamble just like how preamble tells you the scope of the entire law heading tells us the scope of the sections which are under the heading it is very important as important as a preamble but the second uh, view says heading is not all that important we will look at heading only if there is a severe doubt otherwise we will not look at the heading okay then comes marginal notes marginal notes cannot be used for interpretation only in constitution we will use the marginal notes for interpretation but otherwise marginal notes are not used for interpretation 
then talking about definition sections every act has section 2 generally as a definition section definition section gives you a list of definitions and obviously you can use this for interpretation two types of definitions extensive and exhaustive definitions we've already seen please know that exhaustive definitions are also called as restrictive definitions okay then illustrations for example if you look at contract act almost every section gives you an illustration almost every section gives you an example these sections these illustrations do not form part of the section they are not a part of the section but they are a part of the statute they are not a part of the section but they are a part of the statute so illustrations also you can use for interpretation they are not a part of the section but they are a part of the statute then coming to proviso exception and savings clause this is important a proviso accepts something out of the enactment qualifies something which would be within its purview if the proviso was not there it removes special cases and provides for them specially proviso what it simply does is it first creates an exception first it creates an exception first it removes something from the law and then on for that something it creates a se separate a special provision what does a proviso do it first removes something from the law and then for the something it creates a special provision what will you write in the examination it accepts something out of the enactment it accepts accepts as in it removes something out of the enactment it qualifies something in the enactment it accepts it qualifies something in the enactment which would be within its purview if the proviso was not there if the proviso was not there even on that something you would have applied the same general rule but what does proviso do it accepts it qualifies something out of the law and it provides a different a special provision for it altogether exception simply stops the law from applying to a specific case exception you know what an exception is it creates a it takes a special case out of the statute it stops the statute from applying to a specific situation exception is intended to restrain to stop the enacting clause to particular cases and savings clause preserves from destruction rights remedies and privileges saves from destructions rights remedies and privileges what is a proviso come on guys what will you write in the examination accepts qualifies something out of the statute which would be within its purview if the proviso was not there we are doing all this just one one and a half hour before the examination very easily you will be able to recall this what does a proviso do it accepts something it qualifies something out of the enactment which would be within its purview if the proviso was not there right what does a proviso do it removes general it removes special cases from the enactment and provides for them generally what does an exception do it stops the law from applying to a particular case very simple words it stops the law from applying to a particular case and what does savings clause do it preserves from destruction rights remedies and privileges it saves from destruction it preserves from destruction rights remedies and privileges come on without seeing proviso exception and savings clause important what are the key words what is a proviso guys what did we just say first we said it accepts something it qualifies something out of the enactment which would be within its purview if the proviso was not there it removes special cases from the statute and provides for them specifically then what does exception do it stops the law from applying to a special case what does a savings clause do savings clause preserves from destruction any rights remedies and privileges till here clear right shall we continue guys yes so this was about proviso exception and savings clause now coming to explanation here guys an mcq question is possible listen 
explain uh, which point where uh, widen the ambit where was it here it should not be construed as to widen the ambit of the section explanation does not widen the ambit of a section explanation does not widen the ambit of the section means what it does not increase the scope of the action uh, scope of the section explanation also it is a part of the statute even explanation can be used to interpret the statute it may be added to include something or to exclude something from the section but it does not increase the scope of the section it does not widen the ambit of the section why do we put an explanation into the section to explain the meaning or to clarify the vagueness or to fill the gap to suppress the mischief three points here which i want you to remember what does an explanation do it either includes something or it excludes something but it does not widen the ambit of the section and what is the whole objective number 1 to explain meaning and intent of the act number 2 to clarify vagueness and number 3 to fill the gap number 1 to explain meaning and intent of the act number 2 to clarify vagueness in the act and number 3 to fill the gap meaning and intent clarify vagueness and to fill the gap then schedules even they are a part of the act even they can be used for interpretation and then finally we are supposed to read the statute as a whole we are supposed to read the statute as a whole we cannot read it in bits and pieces we are supposed to read the statute as a whole in such a way that we are able to give effect to the entire statute in case you get a question from here you can also connect this with harmonious construction that we should read the statute as a whole and we should give effect to all the sections in the statute all right this is it about the internal aids then coming to the external aids historical setting refers to the situation which gave rise to the enactment long back when the law was made at that time what was the situation in the country what kind of parliamentary discussions were happening what was the problem existing at that time what was the existing statute so that is a historical setting long back when the law was made at that time what was the situation then consolidating statute and previous law here i am looking at the previous laws if there is some doubt for me in the in companies act 2013 i may look at 1956 act also for interpretation but we always apply internal aids first only if internal aids not possible only if internal aids are not helping only then we apply the external aids okay then usage usage refers to what usage is the custom your uh, age old customs and practices which you have been following they will continue to be used for interpretation then you can also use earlier acts and later acts and analogous acts sometimes the law itself says that if you want to you know understand the meaning of this particular point then you go to that other act for example if you want to understand the meaning of the word security you go to securities contract regulation act and you understand the meaning from there so you can understand the meaning of laws even from earlier and later acts then dictionary definitions first you should always try to find the definition in the act itself if you are not able to find the definition in the act you try to look for the definition in the general clauses act at least if you don't find a definition there also you see if there is any judicial decision any past any a uh, past court case which gives the definition you choose that if even that is not possible then you refer to dictionaries if it's a technical word you have to refer to a te technical dictionary and lastly foreign decisions even decisions of foreign courts you can use to interpret laws in india but that you can you do only if you don't have any indian judicial decision if you don't have any indian judicial decision then you can look at foreign decisions also all right so with this we are done with our revision relating to general clauses act and interpretation of statutes interpretation of statutes the primary rules and the secondary rules i've gone pretty much in depth all right i am sure you will be able to recall all this in the examination now listen we are some another half an hour maybe we can do a discussion anything specific that you want me to discuss with you those of you who are watching the ses uh, session right now i'll give priority to those of you who are in the session right now instead of looking at the old messages you guys tell me anything else that you want me to pick and discuss we still have another 20 minutes maybe we can discuss if you're on the way to the examination center on the way you can listen to this anything else
in the comments box please in the comment section please tell me general clause is like an interpretation of statutes around 10 marks you'll get in the examination guys last one hour discussion 10 marks i think very easily you will be able to ace it all the keywords in your mind yes no message in the chat box see section 8 companies one small discussion i want to have with you regarding that now section 8 companies we know that they're not supposed to use their profits for declaration of dividend remember right section 8 companies they cannot use their profits for distribution as dividend then what would they do with the profit they use that profit for their own charitable purposes but they cannot distribute that profit as dividend to the shareholders similarly at the time of liquidation if they have any surplus profits if they have any surplus a uh, surplus assets even though surplus assets they cannot distribute to their shareholders they can give those surplus assets to some other section 8 company having similar objects only okay but then uh, there are some situations in which their license can be revoked when does their license get revoked number 1 when they do something when 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 the section 8 company does not follow the terms and conditions of the license or when the section 8 company starts doing something fraudulently or when the section 8 company violates its objects or when it does something which is against prejudicial interest in these four cases their license will be revoked once the license is revoked what do we do once a license is revoked what does a, a central government do either the central government will pass an order asking this company to convert into public or private company or the central government will pass an order asking the company to wind up or it will amalgamate the section 8 company with another section 8 company but similar objects when will the license be revoked if the uh, if the section 8 company does something which is against the terms and conditions of the license or if section 8 company does fraudulent activities or if its activities violate its objectives or if it does something against public interest in such cases license will be revoked and either it will be converted into public or private company or it will be wound up or it will be amalgamated with another section 8 company but with similar objects now uh, in case it is wound up in case it is wound up there might be surplus assets surplus assets cannot be distributed to shareholders then what to do with surplus assets either they will be transferred to another section 8 company with similar objectives or it will be sold and the proceeds will be given to insolvency and bankruptcy fund under insolvency and bankruptcy code 2016 in case section 8 company is wound up because of central government order here then what to do with the surplus either donate to another section 8 company with similar objectives or so sell them and put the money into insolvency and bankruptcy fund under insolvency and bankruptcy code 2016 so this was one thing one extra thing i wanted to discuss with you all from domestic comp uh, from um, section 8 company then holding in subsidiary company remember can subsidiary company hold shares in the holding company subsidiary company generally cannot hold shares in the holding company but these three cases subsidiary company can hold right what are the three cases subsidiary company can hold shares as legal representative of a deceased member as a trustee and even shares which they were holding even before holding subsidiary relationship was formed they can continue to hold but in the third case what is the third case they are holding shares even before holding subsidiary relationship was formed that they can continue to own in that case they will not get voting rights but if subsidiary company is holding shares in holding company as trustee or as legal representative then they will get voting rights this is another point which i wanted you to remember then small company small company remember the numbers paid up share capital not more than 2 crores paid up share capital not more than 2 crores and turnover not more than 20 crores paid up share capital not more than 2 crores and turnover not more than 20 crores now those of you who are asking me for csr csr again you will find an existing video you there is an existing video if you look at the amendments video the um, december 2021 amendments video if you see their csr has been explained in detail you quickly go to that video and watch it life explorer you still have time finish it off watch in 2x speed again and finish it off you want me to send you the link
if you look at the 2021 amendments video you will find csr as a separate discussion altogether and if you see in the comment section of that video you will find exactly where is the csr provision timestamp you will find in the comment section all right you go to the, i'll send you the link the link i've sent just now the link i've sent is for csr arsha is asking me about buyback arsha even buyback there is a separate video altogether you go watch that again watch it in 2x speed i sent the link to that also i have sent two links in the comment section the first link is for csr go to the comment section in that link and see the timestamp for csr start watching from there then arsha for buyback i sent the second link watch that in 2x but okay because that video is a little slow watch it in 2x speed you'll get done faster all right so then so, so continuing with the next discussion small company paid up share capital not more than two crores turnover not more than 20 crores but then these four companies can never be small companies public companies holding company subsidiary company section 8 company and statutory companies these companies cannot be small companies at all all right then um one more thing I wanted to discuss with you from here about one person companies I wanted to discuss before that yeah at this point let us see um here if the company continues with less than seven members or with less than two members for more than six months even more than six months it is continuing with less than seven members less than two members public company private company respectively then the members of that company will now become personally liable they'll have personal liability for all loans of the company but for which loans only those loans which the company borrowed after the six months period so if a company continues with less than minimum number of members for more than six months then whoever are the existing shareholders of the company they will now have personal liability for all the loans of the company which were borrowed after the six months period all right so this is about another point which you should remember remember personal liability will be only for loans which the company borrowed after the six months period and the one person company some amendment points i should be discussing with you one person company can be converted into public private company anytime but it can never be converted into section 8 company it cannot do nbfc activity it cannot invest in other companies also it cannot invest in other companies it cannot do nbfc activities any person can be member or nominee of the one person company but he should not be a minor should be a natural person should be an indian citizen all right can be resident or non resident doesn't matter now listen in one person company that is one member right this one member can it be a company reliance industries limited is a company it has many shareholders can one of the shareholders be one person company both not allowed one person company cannot be a shareholder in another company in one person company another company cannot be a shareholder both the points clear one person company cannot be a shareholder of another company also in one person company that one member cannot be another company remember this mcq possible from here all right then after this um Section 10A also I wanted to discuss with you all. One quick look. Let's give at Section 10A here. What does Section 10A say? Section 10A says, company, you got the certificate of incorporation. But before you can commence business, before you can borrow money, you're supposed to do some things. What are you supposed to do? Your director is supposed to file a declaration with the ROC saying that all the subscribers to the memorandum, they have paid for the shares taken up by them. We know, right, that subscribers, all of them have to take minimum one share, right? So the subscribers have to, uh, uh, they, obviously those shares are not for free. Subscribers have to pay for those shares. So within 180 days from incorporation, the director has to give a declaration to the ROC saying that the director has, uh, saying that the subscribers have fully paid for the shares which they have taken up. Only then they can start business. Then number two, in case any approval is required, for example, any SEBI approval is required or any RBI approval is required, all those approvals also they should obtain and file with the ROC. And number three, they should file address proof. Don't write address proof, but write verification of registered office. 
verification of registered office they have to file this with roc when within 30 days from incorporation verification of registered office has to be filed with the roc within 30 days of incorporation okay so for a director's declaration 180 days for verification of registered office 30 days this is one thing i wanted to discuss with you and also this what are the orders which nclt can pass in case incorporation is done by submitting wrong information for incorporation if we submitted wrong documents then what order will the nclt pass either nclt can pass an order to regulate company's management or it can ask for changing the moa aoa or it can say that the shareholders liability will be unlimited or it can remove the company's name or it can pass an order for winding up or any order as it deems fit change the mo uh, it can either uh, regulate company's management change moa away or direct liability will be unlimited or remove the company's name from the register or order winding up of the company or any other order as it thinks fit okay so these two extra concepts i wanted to discuss with you section 10a and uh, this part about nclt's order then guys i also want to discuss with you about this name cancellation the name change see listen to this yeah look at this in case the company's name is very similar to the name of an existing company or in case a company's name is very similar to the name of an existing registered trademark central government can ask the company to change the name company is supposed to change the name within three months earlier it was six months but now for both it is three months central government can ask the company to change the name company will have to change the name within three months all right in uh, once a company changes the name within 15 days of the change company is supposed to inform the roc about it all right so the, here central government is asking the company to change the name because company's name is similar to the name of an existing company or because company's name is very similar to the name of an existing registered trademark company is supposed to do the change within three months and then inform the roc within 15 days all right guys one more just quickly let us also finish up entrenchment provision once uh where did it go here what are entrenchment provisions entrenchment provisions will make it a little more stricter a little more difficult to alter the articles of association it will be a little more stricter than special resolution how do you insert entrenchment provision either in the original aoa which you prepared while incorporating the company either that time itself you can put the entrenchment provision or later you can amend the aoa and you can put the entrenchment provision now later if you're amending the aoa and if you're putting the entrenchment provision if it's a public company you need just a special resolution if you're a private company you need a unanimous resolution so to put an entrenchment provision if you're amending the aoa if you're a public company you need a special resolution if you're a private company you need a unanimous resolution all right just one another small point in this chapter in the moa aoa chapter this one after you raise the money by issuing a prospectus you should use the money only for the purpose which is written in the prospectus if you if you want to start using the money for some other purpose you for you must first get a special resolution by postal ballot you must publish it in one english newspaper one vernacular newspaper having wide circulation in the place where the registered office is situated you must also put the justification in the company's website and dissenting shareholders shareholders who are not okay with this change they must be given an exit opportunity by promoters and shareholders so after you've raised money you've done public issue you've raised money but you want to use the money for some other purpose get shareholders permission how by passing a special resolution through postal ballot then put details of the resolution in one english newspaper one vernacular newspaper put it even in the company's website dissenting shareholders give them exit opportunity uh, who will give them exit opportunity promoters and shareholders they will buy the company's uh, they will buy the dissenting shareholders shares all right then coming to some important concepts in the prospectus chapter listen coming to prospectus first of all this point you are supposed to file a copy of the prospectus with the roc right uh, only then you are supposed to issue it to the public now once you file a copy of the prospectus with the roc within 90 days it has to be issued to the public first you file the copy of the uh, prospectus with the roc then within 90 days you are supposed to issue the prospectus to the public then remember offer for sale here the prospectus is called deemed prospectus by it doesn't have to be filed with the roc like any other pros prospectus see what are the differences between prospectus and deemed prospectus 
prospectus is something that we issue when we're doing a public offer, IPO or FPO. And deemed prospectus is what we issue when we are making a when we are making an offer for sale. When we do when we issue a prospectus, all right, we should make sure that the uh, we have to file it with the ROC. But deemed prospectus does not have to be filed with the ROC. Then another thing I want to discuss with you from the prospectus discussion is misstatement of prospectus. In case there is a misstatement, section 34 and section 35 applies. Section 34, criminal liability, right? Here, prospectus is ICD. Prospectus is issued, circulated, and distributed. And this prospectus is a misleading prospectus because it contains an incorrect statement. Then all the persons who authorize the issue of prospectus, they will be punished under section 447. 447 penalty important imprisonment six months to 10 years and fine up to three times the amount involved imprisonment six months to 10 years and fine three times the amount involved until you are following until you're clear yes um prospectus criminal liability section 34 prospectus is already issued circulated and distributed and now we realize prospectus is misleading then all the persons who had authorized the issue of prospectus, all of them will be punished under section 447. What is this section 447 punishment? Imprisonment six months to 10 years and fine up to three times amount involved. But even these persons will not be punished if they are able to prove that the omission was immaterial or if they are able to prove that they had reasonable ground to believe and they did believe up to the time of issue of prospectus that statement was true, inclusion omission was necessary. By this point, because if criminal liability has to get attracted, mens rea is a precondition, right? Mens rea means what? Guilty mind. So if I'm, if I'm able to prove I did not even have any guilty mind, if I'm able to prove that I had reasonable ground to believe and I did believe that the statement was true or omission was necessary, then I will not be punished under section 447. Under civil liability, whom do we punish? Directors. Then every person who authorized himself to be named as director, promoter, Every person who authorized the issue of prospectus, same like criminal liability, an expert. These five people are responsible to whom? To all those persons who subscribed. You do not say purchase. You say subscribed. All those persons who subscribed to the company's shares, relying on the prospectus. Prospectus contains misleading statement because of which they suffered a loss. So here, a loss is important. The subscribers relied on the prospectus and they purchased shares of the company. See, if these, so if these persons have purchased shares of the company directly from the stock market, you will not apply civil liability. Civil liability will apply only if they relied on the prospectus and they directly subscribed for the company's shares. Okay, then if they suffered a loss because of this misleading prospectus, for that loss, these five people will be personally liable. But even these people will not be personally liable if they are able to prove that the misstatement was in an expert statement or if they are able to prove that uh, I, was, I had given my written consent to be a director, but I had withdrawn my consent before the issue of prospectus or that prospectus was issued without my knowledge. As soon as I came to know about it, I gave a reasonable public notice about it. In such cases, I will not be held liable. All right, so this is about civil liability. So criminal liability, civil liability, fine. Criminal liability, who will be punished? All those persons who, issue, who authorize the issue of prospectus, they will be punished under section 447, but they will not be punished if they prove that omission was immaterial or if they prove that they had reasonable grounds to believe and they did believe up to the time of issue of prospectus that the statement was true or inclusion or omission was necessary. All right, civil liability, who are the five people? Directors, every person who authorized himself to be named as director, promoter, every person who authorized the issue of prospectus and expert. These five people will be liable to all those persons who subscribe to the company's shares on the basis of a prospectus, which contains a misleading statement and hence they suffered a loss. So for that loss, these five people will be personally liable. And remember, guys, the whole burden of proof, the onus of proof is on the allottee. He'll have to prove that there was a misstatement and I suffered a loss because of the misstatement. All right. Then under the prospectus chapter, another important thing I want to discuss with you is um, private placement. You're aware, right? Private placement, a maximum to how many people the company can make the offer. As per Act 50, as per the rules, 200. But this is what we apply. 200 overrides 50. 
okay so actually speaking we can make an offer to 200 people but this 200 people is per security so equity shares 200 people preference shares 200 people divided uh, debentures 200 people like that but this limit is not applicable to housing finance companies and nbfcs housing finance companies and nbfcs they can make the uh, offer to any number of people for them no limit all right and in when you're calculating the limit you will not include qualified institutional buyers and esops all right and remember for private placement a prior special resolution is required also private placement you are supposed to allot within 60 days of receiving the money if you are not able to allot within 60 days within next 15 days you refund if you are not able to refund within next 15 days 12% interest you will have to pay all right for uh, private placement prior special resolution is required underwriting remember if you want to pay underwriting commission you need articles of ao association should authorize first you will pay commission out of proceeds of the issue out of pro uh, profits or out of both how much commission can you pay if they are shares you can pay 5% of issue price issue price not face value 5% of issue price or aoa rate whichever is lower for debentures you can pay 2 and 1/2% of the issue price or aoa rate whichever is lower so for shares how much can you pay 5% of the issue price or aoa rate whichever is lower for debentures how much can you pay a uh, 2.5% of the issue price or aoa rate whichever is lesser all right then allotment allotment remember uh, application has to be minimum 5% of the face value application money has to be minimum 5% of the face value once we receive application money within 30 days we should receive minimum subscription sorry uh, once once we issue the prospectus from the date of issue of prospectus within 30 days we must receive minimum subscription and application money within 30 days if we are not able to receive minimum subscription within next 15 days we must return the money if you are not able to return the money within 15 days we'll have to pay 18% interest and also remember in case my allotment is irregular it becomes voidable voidable at whose option voidable at the allottee's option all right so that is it what i wanted to discuss with you all under prospect this then under share capital for buyback a uh, video is already existing you can have a look at that in case you are having confusions about buyback then equity shares with differential rights conditions i hope you are aware what is the first condition the aoa should authorize then we need a prior ordinary resolution as a general meeting but if it is a listed company it should be by postal ballot maximum maximum how many equity shares with differential rights we can issue maximum 74% of total voting power three preceding financial years there should not be any offence relating to uh, filing financial statements and annual return three preceding financial years there should not be any offence relating to rbi act sebi act scra and fema then five preceding financial years there should not be any default relating to term loan statutory payments transferring money to iepf no subsisting default relating to payment of dividend deposits and debentures six there are seven conditions aoa should authorize prior ordinary resolution maximum 74% of total voting power last three years no offence relating to financial statements and annual return then last three years no offence under rbi act sebi act and scra and fema then in case there is any default relating to repayment of term loan transferring money to iepf or making payment of statutory dues first rectify the default wait for 5 years only then you can issue equity shares with differential rights and lastly no subsisting default relating to dividend debentures and deposits all right guys anything else anything else specifically that you want me to discuss about tell me in the chat box because i am just planning to go on till 130 covering as much as i can whatever i think is important all right so this was about equity shares with differential rights then next i want to discuss with you all you'll know about premium what are the five purposes for which we can use premium to issue bonus shares to write off preliminary expenses to write off share issue expenses Uh, then for premium on redemption of preference shares and debentures just a premium on redemption alone we can use from here and also for buyback of shares and guys also remember this um, preference shares they have to be redeemed within maximum how many years preference shares have to be redeemed within maximum 20 years and for debentures the period is 10 years okay for preference shares 20 years debentures it is 10 years but for both if they are raising money for infrastructure project it becomes 30 years all right then um what else sweat equity shares remember special resolution is to be passed and allotment should be made within 12 months 
when special resolution is passed, it will be valid only for 12 months. Within 12 months, we're supposed to allot the sweat equity shares. Maximum how many sweat equity shares can be issued in a year? 15% of the paid up share capital or 5 crores, whichever is higher. But totally, overall, for startups, 50% of paid up share capital, others 25% of paid up share capital. This is overall. But in a year, 15% of paid up share capital or 5 crore rupees, whichever is higher. Sweat equity shares will have a lock-in period of three years, but there is no such lock-in period in ESOPs. In ESOPs, you have vesting period instead. You're understanding. Sweat equity shares, lock-in period is three years. And in ESOPs, no lock-in period provision. Instead, you have vesting period provision. Vesting period should be minimum one year. Remember that, all right? Then coming to the next point, rights issue, minimum 15 days. Maximum 30 days, the period should be given to the shareholders. And the letter of offer should be sent to the shareholders at least three days before opening the issue. Three things, three time limits, 15 days, 30 days. The issue should be kept open for minimum 15 days, maximum 30 days. And the letter of offer should be sent to them at least three days before opening the issue. Even when the company wants to issue convertible preference shares or convertible debentures, it needs special resolution. Convertible preference shares and debentures, okay? To issue bonus shares, you can take money out of free reserves, securities premium, or out of CRR. It should be authorized by articles of association, recommended by both, authorized by the shareholders in the general meeting. There should not be any default relating to deposits and debentures. There should not be any default relating to statutory dues. All the existing shares should be made fully paid up. Listen, this fully paid up condition, where and all do you have? If you want to redeem preference shares, before redeeming preference shares, they should be fully paid up. Only then you can redeem. If you want to issue bonus shares, your existing shares should be fully paid up. Only then you can issue. If you want to buy back shares, those shares have to be fully paid up. Only then you can buy back the shares. Remember these three situations, all the three situations, they should be first fully paid up. Only then you can do it. All right, guys. Then next, I also wanted to discuss with you about the time limits for uh, here, these time limits. If, if I'm a private company or whether I'm a public company, if the company wants to refuse the transfer of shares, the company has to send me the notice of refusal within 30 days. Okay, they're supposed to send me the notice of refusal within 30 days. If they don't send me notice of refusal within 30 days, then within 60 days from the date on which the information was delivered to the company, I can go and file an appeal before the NCLT if I'm a private company. If I'm a public company, I get 90 days. In simple words, listen, in both, company will send notice of refusal within 30 days. If the company sends notice of refusal and if you're not okay with the notice of refusal, come the transferee can go and file an appeal. Transferee will file an appeal within 30 days if it's a private company, within 60 days if it is a public company. Okay. If notice of refusal itself is not received, then within 60 days from intimation of transmission, total 60 days, 30 plus 30, 60 days, transferee can go and file an appeal. If uh, in a public company, notice of refusal also not received within 30 days, then 30 plus 60, total 90 days, the transferee can go and file an appeal before NCLT. You're aware of all this. You remember I've discussed all this with you in detail, 30 plus 30, 30 plus 60. And remember one more thing, notice of refusal, company will give to both. Company will give notice of refusal to transferer and transferee. Okay, but who can file appeal? Only transferee can file appeal. Remember that part. Then uh, what else? Alteration of share capital, the five methods, increasing authorized share capital, consolidation, then subdivision, converting fully paid up shares into stock and cancelling shares which are not taken up by the public. This is also called as diminution of share capital. Just spend a second and look at the spelling of diminution. A lot of students make a mistake here. It is diminution, diminution of share capital. All right, guys. Then reduction of share capital, three ways. Either you extinguish or you reduce the liability of members relating to capital not paid up. You reduce the liability. You tell them that they don't have to pay the balance money. For example, 10 rupees share, only 8 rupees they had paid. Balance 2 rupees, you can tell them no need to pay. So extinguish the liability of shares regarding the amount not paid up or write off or cancel the lost paid up share capital. What do you mean by lost paid up share capital? Share capital, which is not reflected by assets. And number three, pay off, return the excess share capital. All right, guys. So what are the three ways in which you can reduce share capital? Number one, you reduce the liability of shareholders or number two, 
you pay off the excess share capital or number 3 you write off you cancel the paid up share capital you cancel the lost paid up share capital lost paid up share capital means share capital which is not represented by assets of the company now for this you need tribunal confirmation once you file an application to the tribunal tribunal will send a copy of the application to four people central government roc sebi and creditors if they have any representation they will send representation keyword representation within 3 months if they don't send any representation it means no objection if any creditor is objecting we should somehow get his consent or discharge him or give him some security secure his debt all right then uh, we also need audit a certificate that accounting will be exactly as per the accounting standard once we have ncltis confirmation then company will file ncltis confirmation with the roc within 30 days only once it is filed with the roc only then the reduction will be effective we also have to file with the roc minutes which are approved by the tribunal which will contain a summary of the entire reduction of share capital process all right so this was about reduction guys guys this this is something i want to discuss with you all before i close financial assistance generally company cannot give a loan to a person and ask that person use this money and go buy my shares instead company can give financial assistance in these cases number 1 bank can give financial assistance no problem then number 2 company can give financial assistance to a trustee to buy its own shares or shares of its holding company for the benefit of employees but for this prior special resolution is required and number 3 company can give loans to its own employees okay but other than directors other than kmp maximum 6 months salary can be given as a loan to buy its own shares or shares of holding company so it can give loan to trustees it can give loan to employees employees should not be director and kmp if i'm giving loan to employee it should not be more than 6 months salary all right guys yes 6 months salary i'm discussing with you here connected point let me tell you employee is giving money to the company this money is less than or equal to his annual salary then this money will not be considered as deposit i just got reminded of this when we spoke about 6 month salary deposit chapter you have list of exclusions right when employee is giving money to the company and this money is within his annual salary then it will not be considered as deposit if he is going to give money which is more than his annual salary then it will be considered as deposit all right guys enough that's enough you can close your books now next 15 minutes no touching your books just stop studying you've studied enough there's a lot of content in your head you have all the knowledge in the world very easily you will go and you will ace the paper okay close your books next 15 minutes just do some deep breathing just you know relax yourselves and just wait for 145 145 walk into the examination hall see the question paper stay calm the question paper will be in your favor just in case you find one question which is little tricky do not let it affect you guys remember it is a mental game all right it's a war inside the examination hall and you will not let the examiner win against you all right guys walk into the examination hall with a lot of confidence you have put in your best the last two and a half days so walk in like a boss all right take the question paper question by question one by one you read spot your two best questions two questions which you think you will do really well and you begin your answer with those two questions finish those two questions then take the mcq question paper finish the mcqs and then do the rest of the question paper okay write as fast as you can at the same time stay calm you will all do really well an exemption a minimum 60 to 65 is what our aim is and we will be able to reach that okay guys all the very best now close your books all right be satisfied with whatever preparation you've done be content put a smile on your face and just relax for the next 15 minutes 1:45 you walk into the examination hall once you're done with the examination you make sure you tell me how exactly your paper went all right and once you tell me how your paper went your thoughts about law will get over and then you start working on the next paper okay guys all the very best thank you guys bye bye